My name is Steven Springhorn. I'm a member of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Offices team in Sacramento. I'm joined by my colleagues Heather Shannon, Ben Gooding, and Monica Reese, who will be helping present information today. The purpose of the webinar today is our first step in an effort to provide information and hear feedback and answer your questions on the Groundwater Sustainability Plan submittal process and the tools that the department has generated to facilitate that process. Today's agenda will be a uh, brief uh, welcome and introduction as well as webinar instructions on how to submit comments or questions. A brief overview of the SIGMA or Sustainable Groundwater Management Act and Groundwater Sustainability Plan regulations as they relate to Groundwater Sustainability Plan submittals. Say. And transition and Heather Shannon will provide an overview of the GSP reporting, reporting system. system. We'll pause, we'll pause there, there for any, for any questions, questions on that, that information, information that was, that was presented. presented. You're going to play it uh, uh, Ben uh, Gooding. Uh, provide an overview of the monitoring module that's related to the plan reporting system. And we'll have questions on that. And then we'll con conclude with a general question and answer session at the end of this webinar. So how to ask questions uh, during any time during this webinar. You can email your questions to the email address shown on the screen, sgmps at water.ca.gov. Please include a subject line GSP presentation question. DWR staff will be keeping a queue of submitted questions and we'll be reading those and answering those um, at the various question and answer sessions. This meeting will, and webcast will be recorded and will be posted in the near future on DWR's Sustainable Groundwater Management Act webpage at the address shown on the slide. If there are any technical difficulties or issues that you're encountering during this webinar, please also email that sgmps at water.ca.gov. We have team members monitoring that inbox and can help you as needed. So now we'll start an overview of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act as it relates to, to GSP submittal. Um, there are a number of steps uh, that have occurred and that will occur during SIGMA implementation, with the first one being the formation of groundwater sustainability agencies. And that was back in June 2017. That was a uh, a lot of hard work and effort at the local level to form those groundwater sustainability agencies. And that was a, a big success where 99% of the area that needed to be covered was covered by that deadline. And that resulted in 260 or over 260 groundwater sustainability agencies that were formed across the state, shown in the green areas on the map. The next step in Sigma is the current activity that's occurring throughout the state is the development of groundwater sustainability plans due in either roughly five months in January 2020 or two years after that in January 2022. There was an initial requirement to for GSAs to submit a, a groundwater sustainability plan notification. Um, we've okay. received 136 of those throughout the state shown on the map. Yeah. And that is an indication of where GSPs are being developed and likely going to be submitted. After that GSP yeah. submittal, we'll, and we'll talk about the focus of this webinar is to talk about how that yeah. submittal is going to occur, is the implementation of that GSP over the 20 year implementation horizon of the act. With the ultimate outcome, through adaptive management of achieving sustainability within that 20 years by 2040 or 42. The common theme between all these steps and the activities that have taken place and will take, it, take place into the future is that all this information gets submitted on the SIGMA portal. 
That is the Department of Water Resources Clearinghouse for Sustainable Groundwater Management Act information that is submitted to us as required by the law and regulations. There is access for groundwater sustainability agencies today. as well as access to the public to view the information that is submitted by the GSAs. This Sigma portal was launched back in 2015 and has uh, received all of the information uh, for groundwater sustainability agencies, the GSP initial notifications, and other Sigma related reporting requirements. We plan and we have built the GSP, this new GSP submittal tool, building off of the previous modules that have been developed so far. So there will be a same similar look and feel to how to submit information for your plan and similar permissions and information that has already been submitted. So just as a quick reminder, if you haven't muted your phone, please mute your phone um, so we uh, don't hear any background noise. Thank you for that. So with that introduction um, or intro, I would like to turn it over to Heather Shannon to go over information on the groundwater sustainability plan submittal process and tools. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Um, so as Stephen mentioned, today I'm gonna provide an overview of the groundwater sustainability plan reporting system. Um, I'll cover the steps to walk you through what that process will look like through our online system. Uh, briefly talk about some training materials that we're preparing and that will be available through our website in the near future. Um, I will briefly touch on annual reports and how that system um, will be up and running soon. Um, and it's just kind of a reminder to folks that that um, deadline is in April following submittal of GSPs for those in, in the um, January 2020 with the January 2020 deadline. And then I'll follow up with questions from the audience. So the purpose for developing this GSP reporting system really stems from the requirements in the GSP regulations, which uh, require DWR to provide forms and instructions to GSAs submitting plans. Uh, the regulations require local agencies to submit their plans electronically to the department through this online reporting system in a, in a format that is provided by the department. So during the development of this GSP reporting system, our objective was really to make the system simple for the user to navigate through the submittal process. Um, and we wanted to provide adequate guidance to all users to make it as straightforward as possible. The GSP reporting system provides the opportunity for GSAs to identify contents in the GSP that address or support specific GSP uh, regulation elements. Um, building the reporting system, we recognize that a not one size fits all um, and we needed some flexibility to address different situations. And what I mean by that is that we know that in some basins, there may be multiple DSPs that are being developed with a coordination agreement. Um, and in others, there may be a single GSP that may be multiple DSAs. So really, we wanted the system to be able to handle any kind of situation um, that arises. We also built the system with uh, flexible permissions, knowing that um, in some situations, a plan manager may not want to uh, go through all the submittal steps on their own. They may wish to delegate that responsibility to others or uh, at their office or potentially a consultant. So 
Um, we've built the system so that there are those opportunities for multiple people to uh, create the submittal and walk through the steps. So next I will walk you through the GSP reporting system submittal steps. Um, in subsequent slides, I'll go through each of these items, A through F, from creating the GSP to populating uh, different information that's requir required as part of the submittal. So for those GSAs, when they log in to the Sigma portal, um, this will be the new appearance that they will see with the addition of um, a modified groundwater sustainability plans module and um, the monitoring network, which Ben will be discussing a little bit later on during this webcast. So when the GSAs log in and select GSP, this GSP dashboard will show up. The dashboard has uh, four different areas, one for the initial notification, one for the GSP submittal, one for coordination agreement, and then annual reports. So the initial notifications, as Stephen mentioned earlier, were submitted prior to development of the GSP. In the GSP submittal process, anyone with permission from a GSA in the basin can start a GSP submittal. Also, a user can request permission for the GSA or for the basin from a GSA. The annual reports uh, button is coming soon. As you can see on the screen, it's not yet been developed, but I'll touch upon that at closer to the end of my presentation. So to initiate the GSP submittal, the user would click the new button under my GSP submittal and a pop-up screen will show up. And the intent of the pop-up screen is to provide information to the user to alert them of what they should expect in the upcoming screens and to prepare them uh, for what information they'll need to submit. The pop-up is also intended to provide a notification to the user that they will need to uh, input and upload monitoring network information in a separate monitoring network module. After uh, the user clicks close, it will advance them to this next screen to create a new GSP submittal. In this screen, they'll need to identify the basin select an initial notification, which is from a pre-populated list um, that's been generated from our system. And then they'll need to identify whether a single GSP or multiple GSPs will be prepared within the basin. If multiple GSPs are selected, the user will have to create a local identifier for the GSP. And so that's just for them to use um, and to recognize that that's their specific GSP. The next page after they select, after you select create, create GSP, takes you to A, the base info. The base info page is automatically populated with the basin name, the GSP initial notification, and whether how many plans are are prepared for the basin. Um, so that information is automatically populated. The new information that needs to be um, added in this screen includes the identification of the plan manager, the plan area, those GSP, uh, GSAs that are collectively submitting the GSP. Um, and then in addition, the GSA will need to upload their notice announcing planned adoption of the GSP, as well as a notice of public hearing to adopt the GSP. You can't see it on this screen, but um, after that information is populated on the page, there's a save and continue button at 
the bottom, which will automatically advance you to the next step. If the user chooses not to continue on and wants to come back to their submittal later, they can do that. They simply would save and continue, and they can log out and log back in at a later time to finish their submittal. If they do continue forward, it will take you next to B, the adopted GSP. And then this page is simply will upload their adopted GSP PDF. If the GSA elects to split the GSP into multiple files, um, we provided a naming convention that they can use um, when they upload those files. The maximum file size for each PDF is 10 gigabytes, but there's no limitation to how many files that can be loaded to the um, online reporting system. And so this maximum file size also applies to some of the additional um, supporting information uh, tabs that I'll show you shortly. After uploading um, the GSP, save and continue will take you to see elements of the plan. And this is the location where the GSA will have the opportunity to identify pages of the GSP that are specifically associated with addressing elements of the GSP regulations. The user has the option of um, taking on this task in two, two different ways. They could either um, download an Excel template and populate the information within the template, or they can choose to enter the information online through the web form. So at the bottom of the page, they can select which option they choose to proceed forward with. If they continue with the Excel format, um, it's under the Elements Guide. And this page will walk them through step-by-step -step instructions of what is needed. So they'd simply download the Excel template and populate the page number field with the associated pages in the GSP. The Excel template provides, with provides the user with specific instructions in the instruction tab. And the elements of the plan tab is where they would uh, fill in information. The user has the opportunity to also identify sections, figures, or tables associated with that um, GSP regulation element, but it's not required. The notes column is an opportunity for the GSA to provide any additional notes they see necessary. However, it's only required if not applicable is filled out under the page numbers of the plan. And an example of where this might, um, might happen is if a GSA does not identify management areas within their GSP, they wouldn't have specific information in the GSP to address that um, specific reg element. So under that instance, they would enter not applicable under page numbers and provide a quick note to identify why it's not applicable. Another example might be if a user uh, splits the GSP into multiple uh, PDF files. So in that instance, the GSA may need to map us to which file the page numbers are referencing. After populating the Excel template, the user would simply drag and drop or upload the file into the box at the bottom of the screen. And then after doing that, select continue. When they select continue, it will automatically advance forward and will populate the web form with information from the Excel template. So the web form, which is under subarticles one through five on the left-hand column, is another way of looking at the information. 
uh, if a GSA chooses not to fill in the Excel template, they could enter the information directly into the web form. So as you see on the screen, under um, the different articles, uh, uh, sections of the regulations, there are page numbers required with a red asterisk. Um, so those are the fields that are filled in in the Excel template or would be required to be filled in in the web form. On this page, they, the GSA also has the opportunity to upload uh, supporting inf information. So you would see on the screen, there's a choose file option. Such information could include GIS files um, that are associated with a map presented in the section of the GSP. Um, it could also include such things as high resolution photos or images or figures um, or potentially public comments that were received on the draft GSP document. This information will then be associated with the section of the GSP regulations where the information is uploaded um, on the elements of the plan um, section of the web form. The user also has the opportunity to provide that supporting information under um, D, supporting info on the left-hand side. So if they choose to do so, they can select D, supporting info, where they would upload this information. Um, the information is required to be associated with the GSP reg element, um, and then the additional information identified by the columns on this page. After uploading supporting information, they would save and continue and advance to the references. References should not be confused with supporting information. This refers to the reference list that would be found at the back of the GSP, or it might include scientific papers or other types of reports that were used um, when developing the groundwater sustainability plan. On the reference uh, page, the user can download the reference, delete it, edit, um, or view the citation associated with that reference. So to add a reference, they would simply um, select the option to add a reference and then um, select a reference type from a, the drop-down menu. There's additional information that's required um, that is that is shown by the asterisk, red asterisk on this form that pops up. The GSP regulations do require that the GSAs provide a reference list and that any generally, uh, any information, any reports that are not generally available to the public, they must provide an electronic copy of that document. So the user has two options in this uh, reference box. They can either provide a URL where um, the document or reference can be found online, or um, as required by the regulations, they can provide the attach an attachment um, with that file. So after saving and uploading all of the references for the GSP, the user will advance forward to the GSP submittal. So on this page, it's simply to remind the user to check and verify that monitoring site information is uploaded in the monitoring network module and verify that all the required fields have been populated. The tool will reject the submittal if all the required information has not been um, submitted in the system. After verifying everything, the user will simply click the box shown on the screen to confirm that they've reviewed the information and that they are ready to submit to DWR. After they select submit to DWR, they can no longer edit the GSP submittal in the system. So it locks down the editing capabilities.
So for those basins that have multiple GSPs that are under, that are being submitted, they are also required to submit the GSPs with a coordination agreement. So the if you remember from the first screen, the GSP dashboard, there's a, a place where coordination agreements must be uploaded. So when you want to select and create a new coordination agreement, this pop-up screen comes up. Um, the user will be required to identify, again, the basin, the number of GSPs, the point of contact that's identified in that coordination agreement, and then they'll be required to upload the coordination agreement. Similar to the GSP submittal, the coordination agreement has this elements guide web form. Um, and on this page, the, the GSA will be required to enter page numbers in the coordination agreement that are associated with uh, requirements in the regulations. After finishing that, the coordination agreement um, can be submitted to DWR. The requirement for those basins with multiple GSPs and a coordination agreement is that all of the GSPs and the coordination agreement are submitted collectively to the department. So the in those basins with multiple GSPs, the coordination agreement must be submitted by the point of contact from that's identified in that basin collectively with those GSPs. Um, again, similar to the um, just the simply the GSP module is that following um, submit to DWR, they can no longer edit the coordination agreement in the online system. So just a few notes on training materials. We are preparing a step-by-step -step manual that's intended to walk the user through every click that they might take um, when going through the online system. What I provided here today is pretty high level, um, but the step-by-step -step manual will be a lot more detailed um, and hopefully address any sort of questions um, the users might have when navigating through the system. We're also developing a quick guide that will that will provide the quickest path through um, to submitting the GSP on the online system and and just show you the shortcuts of how to move through the system. In addition, we have a pocket guide that um, has been prepared to show you with uh, or to provide the user with um, any uh, high level questions they might have. It's also intended for the public user who might wish to comment on the GSPs or view them in the future. I did mention annual reports earlier on, and just to um, highlight this to you all, we are building the annual reports module in the system, um, but uh, I wanted to alert you that there are templates available for downloading and viewing now that are through our adjudicated reporting tab in the Sigma portal, and these can give you an idea of the format for um, those annual reporting requirements. Ben will be talking about uh, well data and groundwater level data that um, are will replace the two buttons that you see, the first two buttons on your screen right now. Um, but the surface water Excel template, total water Excel template, and groundwater storage Excel template would be useful tools or resources for you to look at to figure out the format for annual reporting, um, which is coming up in the future. So we anticipate that the annual reporting module will be available in winter 2019-2020. So at this point, that concludes my section of the presentation. 
Um, and we will, I'll turn it over to Stephen Springhorn for the questions portion. Thank you, Heather. So yeah, now we'll open it up for a question and answer session. So if you do have questions on the information that was presented um, previously, please email those to sgmps at water.ca.gov. So we haven't received any questions yet, so we'll pause just for a brief moment to see if anyone else wants to submit a question. And if not, we'll also have additional time at the end of the presentations to handle or answer any questions that come in. Okay. So seeing that there aren't any questions so far, we'll continue to move forward and handle those at the end of the presentations. So the next portion of the presentation is going to be related to the Groundwater Sustainability Plan Monitoring Network. And this is an important part of the reporting system because this is where a lot of the uh, data, raw data, will be coming into the system and there'll be a lot of transactions happening uh, with the first submittal and also, as Heather mentioned, in the annual reports and as these groundwater sustainability plans are implemented over the planning horizon. So to start with a little bit of background and some context of how we're approaching this is with groundwater monitoring, there's been a previous program in place for a number of years, and that's DWR's California Statewide Groundwater Elevation Monitoring Program, or CASGEM. Historically, the CASGEM program has been how DWR has been able to measure compliance to Water Code Part 2.11, which is a requirement to for the basins in the state to monitor groundwater elevations. Moving forward, since the passage of Sigma, there's been a need to transition data that has been submitted via CASGEM into this new groundwater sustainability plan reporting system. And some reasons for that is Sigma has new requirements um, as it relates to what needs to be in a monitoring network, as well as what needs to be considered uh, to the elements that need to be monitored and included in the plans. So CASGEM was very focused on groundwater elevations, and SIGMA is focused on that and the other five sustainability indicators and the related monitoring sites and data that will be submitted, collected and submitted related to those. Some of the other reasons for this migration is that uh, CASGEM monitoring entities, although could be very similar to the same local agencies that are uh, the new groundwater sustainability agencies. There are new uh, authorities and legal requirements on the groundwater sustainability agencies uh, that are above and beyond the CASGEM monitoring entities. So for that reason, this migration from CASGEM wells and measurements into the SIGMA system, which Ben Gooding will talk more in, in, in details here in a minute, is the reason we wanted all of that information to be in one spot so that the groundwater sustainability agencies have their information that supports their groundwater sustainability plan in one location and for the Department of Water Resources to be able to access that information all in one spot. So with that, I'll turn it over to Ben Gooding and he will walk through the Groundwater Sustainability Plan Monitoring Module. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, as Stephen said, I will continue to discuss the monitoring module and some of the process with the transition from CASGEM into this new monitoring network. So as Stephen said, there's definitely some different requirements uh, between the two, and that's why CASGEM is no longer going to be used for the submittal of 
uh, groundwater level data. Um, as you see, Cash Jam initially was built for the implementation to add groundwater wells for the purpose of collecting groundwater level data, which in turn led to being compliant with part 2.11 of the water code. Uh, today with Sigma uh, and the GSP monitoring network, as you see, we've built in the ability to include sites and wells for both groundwater wells, what we're calling general sites, which include extensometer, stream gauges, um, sites along those lines, and then also existing sites where data has currently been collected in uh, current mon uh, programs. So collectively, this data could include data for all six sustainability indicators. And with this submittal of that data, it will lead to being both uh, compliant with part 2.11 of the water code and with the signal requirements. And so just to give a understanding of how this transition will uh, occur, and I'll go into more detail to, in just a little bit, is in top left here, we see what is a generalized idea of a monitoring network uh, of a monitoring entity within CASGEM. And so this would be a notification for a basin with several wells that are currently monitoring on a biannual process. Well, once this opens up and a GSA comes in, they will have the ability to select wells for migration into the Sigma portal. And on the right upper part here, we see some wells are selected by the GSA. And if we move to the bottom left, after these well migration happens, these selected wells are now seen within the Sigma portal monitoring network while on the bottom right, the remaining wells will still be within cash gem, but the idea of cash gem wells won't exist anymore for those as they will be converted into voluntary wells um, and the notifications will be closed. So I will give uh, more details on that in just a minute. And so to fully understand why, how the monitoring network fits in with the other Sigma, uh, Sigma portal tools, we currently have initial notifications which had to be submitted in order to use the GSP submittal tool with Heather, which Heather just covered. That in conjunction or uh, connected with the monitoring network will lead to a submitted GSP. And in the future, the data that will be submitted through the monitoring network will lead to some of the data that's required for an annual report. So with that, to give a little bit of a background, I'll now go into the specifics of the monitoring network. Um, so what I'll discuss is the three modules, as we're calling them, for groundwater wells, general sites, and existing sites. I'll discuss in detail how to migrate cash gem wells to the Sigma portal, how to add wells in various different types of sites, and how to add well and data uh, site data, and also how to do some localized permissions on a well level instead of on a GSA level. So when you get to the tool, you'll have the option of to select the three modules as stated. And so first I'll cover the groundwater wells. Uh, the groundwater wells tool has five different tools. It'll be to view and edit your data, add new wells, migrate wells, and still have the opportunity to batch import both wells and data similar to the cache gen process. So first we'll cover the migrate wells. If you were to select the migrate wells tab, it would take you to this page here. And on this page here, you would select the options of the ways to do uh, well migration. And the three well ways are using cache gem login of a monitoring entity. You can search for wells by attributes. And these attributes include uh, local well designation, master site code, county, state well number, uh, or cache gem and voluntary wells. Uh, and you can also do geographic search, which mimics the uh, Sigma data viewer, where you can search for wells on basin or GSA boundaries, uh, well depth, um, et cetera. And so just to give an idea of how the process would go using the cash gem login, if you were to select that, it would take you to a page where you would first have to log in using that cash gem entity's password and uh, username. And so once in, at the cash gem account there at step four, you would select which monitoring entity you're using and it would return wells that are associated with that monitoring entity in step five. You would select the wells that you want and press migrate. And at this point, it gives you the opportunity to choose which GSA you are gonna migrate these wells to. And so if you are a single GSA and that's only one GSA associated with your user, it's not going, you know, this won't be an issue, but for multiple of these users out there, 
that are associated with multiple GSAs. Here's where you would be able to divide up where your wells are going. And then by selecting migrate wells, it would start the process of having the wells um, migrated from the cash gem system into the monitoring network. So next I'll talk about adding new wells. Um, by selecting uh, the add new well button, it will take you to a blank well information form. I'm not going to cover all the fields. Most of them are similar to what was required in cash gem, but there are a couple of new fields. A couple of the main ones are well type. The well type is broken up between sigma and sigma representative, and this is due to the different types of monitoring networks that are laid out in the GSP regulations. Uh, sigma will be just your normal monitoring network, uh, according to section 354.34, or your sigma representative is your representative monitoring network uh, laid out in section 0.36. Additionally, there's also principal aquifer. Um, this is a requirement according to the GSP regulations. However, we did not define um, aquifers throughout the state as this is a locally identified aquifer system and this is a free form box that you would fill out based on your um, local findings. Um, as once all of these information is filled, you would simply add the well. I do want to make a couple of notes though on differences between um, cash gem requirements and sigma requirements. Um, the data validation requirements for RP elevation and ground surface elevation is now two decimals, while latitude and longitude is two five decimals. And so some of the wells that are getting migrated from cash gem might not meet these data standards, and you would have to go in and update the well information with updated uh, information that meets the required data standards. Additionally, um, as I said, you could import wells and import groundwater elevations similar to Cash gem. If you were to select one of these fields, it would take you to this screen here where you would simply drag and drop the completed Excel spreadsheet into the box and upload the information. Just to give a reminder of what I'm talking about, this is what the Cash gem uh, spreadsheet looks like, and it will be a similar spreadsheet with updated fields as required by Sigma. As you filled that out and you uploaded, then those would be uploaded. However, we still have the same validation errors built in if the information entered is not correct per our data and reporting standards. And that format in the Sigma monitoring network will vary compared to cash gem where it will now be based on row number, field name, and then your validation error. So as you see here, row two, which would be your first well in the list, and the coordinates accuracy was left empty. And you would have to go back in and fix that on the Excel spreadsheet and re-upload. Um, if there's one error, none of the information would be uploaded to prevent any duplicative uh, data submittals. And lastly, there's the view and update my wells tab. This will just take you to the list of all wells associated with the user. Um, as previously mentioned, I know some users are associated with multiple GSAs. That GSA selects an option tab in the upper middle. If you drop that down, you would be able to filter the wells based on a specific GSA associated with your user. But if you wanted to look at one of your wells, you would select the master site code, which would take you to the well information tab, which is similar to the add new well tab. Here you could edit the well information, and so this would be for the cash gem well specifically at the start, where you have to go in and add some new information. You can also add, edit, delete groundwater elevations, and add and delete well permissions. So if we go to the add groundwater elevation data, um, it is the exact same format as cash gem. It has the same numerical codes for both no measurement types, measurement methods, um, questionable measurements. So all this should be very familiar with individuals that have used uh, some of the department's programs before. Um, so that ends the groundwater wells module. And now I'll go to the general sites module. This has the same uh, tools as the wells, except for migrate. And we'll start with the add new site tab. If you selected it, it brings you to a blank um, add general site field. Um, several of these fields are similar to wells, according to reference point, ground surface, and geography. But I will point out a few that are different. Um, first is site type. This is where you would uh, define what type of general site this is. And these are 
Right now, it includes extensometers, stream gauges, continuous GPS sites, uh, surveying or benchmark sites, remote sensing, or other types of sites. And depending on the general site type that you select there, it will result in different required fields. An example of this would be if you select extensometer, we will expect a total depth or case depth um, information associated with that. And so depending on the site type uh, selected, be prepared to know that there is validations on the data standards required. And if we go to the view update my sites um, tab, we'll notice that it's very similar to the general or to the groundwater wells, but uh, unlike the groundwater wells, we had the master site code, which is uh, which was initially began in cash gem and is about a 16 digit number. We are again making a number that is unique to the department system, but it is just a single number uh, field currently. And when, when you go here, you'll see uh, just the general information that will allow you to distinguish uh, between your general sites. So if you were to select on one of your sites, again, you would be able to have the uh, ability to add data. And I will note here that depending on your site type, again, is it will bring up two different types of data forms. One is for stream gauges, which will have your, the opportunity to include surface water head and surface water discharge data. Um, based uh, when you're uploading data, one or the other or both of these can be filled out, but at least one of the data uh, information fields have to be completed. But if you have one of the other types of general sites that are associated with subsidence information, there is the requirement for both the date of displacement start and the cumulative displacement elevation. And the purpose and idea behind this is the submittal of subsidence data may vary between agencies. Some might submit data on a monthly basis. Some might have a continuous uh, cumulative value from the day the GSP is submitted. And so it is up to the user if they want to go on a monthly or larger time scale. But as long as you have the date of displacement start and the cumulative value for that period, then we can always calculate the cumulative displacement. And that takes us to our last module, the existing sites module. Um, one difference with this module is it does not have the ability to upload data. We are not requiring the dual uh, submittal of data from an existing program. And so the only things here will be the ability to add the existing sites or import the existing sites on a batch uh, form and again to view. And so if we go to one of the add existing sites by selecting that field again, it will take you to a blank, uh, a blank add existing site page, and it's much briefer than some of the other ones. We again still have the same geography requirements, but the main requirements here are going to be program site ID, and that is going to be the site ID associated with that program for that specific site. We want the program name. We want the site URL that takes you to that site or that well. We don't want just the home page. Uh, so if you're using USGS data, we don't want just the, the, the home page. We want it to that exact, exact site. Again, there are site types, and these are the exact same as the general sites, except for groundwater wells is now added as a selection because it is expected that uh, most of the data or several or large amounts of data that or sites that would be included will be water quality uh, sites. And again, you have your well type, which would be sigma or sigma representative, and then your sustainability indicators. Um, so just to give an idea of what's really expected here so uh, people understand on what we want on the existing sites, is as I stated, your site URL should take you to the exact um, site. So here's just an example of a well with water quality information. And so as you see, the URL is exactly, um, will take us to exactly to this site instead of having to search for it based on program site ID. So lastly, I'll talk about some of the well and site scale permissions. You again have the ability to share uh, permissions on a GSA scale through the GSA tool, as been discussed previously in the GSA times. But in the, here, you'll be able to add permissions to individual wells, to uh, you know people that want to add supplemental data or JSON basins or JSON GSAs. And so here, you'll see the organization, the username of, of people that have permissions to that well. But if you want to add new permissions, you would select Add Permissions. And it would take you to this page here where you would search for a username that is currently in the SIGWA portal. 
and you would associate with an organization. There's two types of organizations here. There is both GSAs, and then there is a subset of about 200 agencies that currently or previously have submitted data to the CASGEM system. These include cities, counties, uh, consultants, et cetera. And so if you want to associate a user with one of these previous agencies, there's no validation checks in that permission or that, um, that association or permission can go through. However, if you try to associate a user with a GSA, there is a validation check that that user has been provided permission on the GSA scale. If not, it will tell you an error, and that user needs to check with the GSA to get permission there prior to getting permission to the well. Once that is complete, you click Save, and that permission will be done. So with that, um, we are back to questions. All right. Thank you, Ben. So now we'll open up uh, a question and answer session for what was just presented by Ben. And we had a number of questions that came in uh, from the, the first presentation from Heather. So what we'll do now is we'll open it up to the Q&A session. Um, I'll be joined by, by colleagues Heather Shannon, Ben Gooding, and Monica Reese. Monica will read the question, and then the, the group of us will answer accordingly. So, so let's start with the first question. Um, so the first one is for Ben. Uh, if the monitoring network module will cover all of the sites that would be covered in a GSA's data management system, is a separate data management system developed by the GSA still required? So this is Stephen. I'll start with that, and Ben can add information as needed. So there is a requirement for, in the regulations, the Groundwater Sustainability Plan regulations, for the local GSAs to develop their own data management system. That will likely house more information about that basin and the stations in that basin than is required to be submitted to the department. So the department will have this reporting system available for GSAs to use, um, although there is that still requirement for the local GSAs to develop their data management system. Um, no, I'm... Okay, we can go on to the next question. Uh, we are wanting to be clear about the accuracy required on the well locations. For five digits of a latitude longitude, the implied accuracy is plus or minus 44 inches. For four digits, the implied accuracy is plus or minus 37 feet. So to answer that, um, the validation in the system is to five uh, decimal places. Where that came from is section 352.4, um, subsection A4 or A5 which states that latitude and longitude coordinates shall be in decimal degree to five decimal places to a minimum accuracy of 30 feet. So if you get within that 30 feet accuracy to four decimal places, you can simply add a zero to the end of it and meet that five decimal place validation requirement. Thank you, Ben. All right, so we can go to the next question. All right. We will still monitor all of our basin cast gem wells, but we are not recommending use of all the basin cast gem wells as representative monitoring wells under our GSP. Should we still migrate all basin cast gem wells? So that would be up to you know the GSA, but if you're still planning to monitor the wells just as part of a monitoring network, then you can migrate them and not select them as part of your representative monitoring network. So within the regs, it clearly defines a monitoring network and a representative monitoring network. So if you want to continue to monitor all of them under your GSP without all of them being representative, I would recommend migrating them all. But if you're planning on just having supplemental uh, monitoring that you don't plan on submitting as part of your GSP, then I would not recommend migrating to wells. Just to build on that answer, we what we're looking for is the information that is submitted to the GSP monitoring module should be the same information that or it matches what's in the adopted groundwater sustainability plan. 
One other part that's related to this question is that we covered the, the beginning of this section about CASGEM, the differences between CASGEM and Sigma. I want to make a point that the CASGEM program still remains and will remain, and but focus on the low and very low basins moving forward. And the monitoring through Sigma will be done in the high and medium basins in the state, as well as any of those lower, very low basin, low priority basins uh, that decide to do a GSP. So both programs, the CASGEM program and the Sigma program, will run concurrently, but not in overlap. So Ben, can you cover what happens to the CASGEM wells that are not migrated to the system and are not meant to be continued to be monitored? Yeah, so if it was chosen that you didn't migrate all of your CASGEM wells and you left uh, a few of them still within uh, CASGEM, following the submittal of your GSP, that notification would close and those CASGEM wells would be converted to voluntary which data can still be uploaded to in the future, but the idea of cash gem wells existing for those wells won't exist anymore. There'll simply be voluntary wells that, as previously known in cash gem, have just been used as supplemental data symbols. Yeah, in both cases of the cash gem program and the data that will be collected and reported in the, the GSP and re reported to the Sigma portal, we still encourage and recommend and are looking for the collection and reporting of groundwater elevations across the state. And so that is something where if there's the um, ability to continue monitoring those wells in these basins, um, please feel free to do so. All right, now we'll go to the next question. Um, so we're still on uh, monitoring. Uh, what DMS does DWR intend to use? So this gets into, could get into a, a bit of a technical question and answer, but in general, the Sigma portal is our data management system for all information that's submitted. Uh, that goes into a enterprise level, the, the groundwater level data itself goes into an enterprise level uh, Oracle database. So that's something we could follow up for more information if there's additional questions or detailed questions on the actual setup or configuration of the data management system and how that data management system might be able to be connected to uh, by the local data management system. Uh, one more on the monitoring website. Um, there's a question regarding whether uh, the public will be able to generate or create um, groundwater elevation reports for a basin based on the data that is available, um, not, but not update, not uploading the data. So that is more on the, the, the public side, uh, obviously, of accessing and understanding the information that's submitted through the Sigma portal and the GSPs. We do uh, are looking for information to be transparent and open and available. Uh, one way to generate reports is actually on an existing web tool that's called the Sigma Data Viewer. That Sigma Data Viewer has a live connection to the database where all of the groundwater elevations and groundwater stations are stored in the state, and that will be updated as new information comes in. There are tools such as hydrograph tools, and the ability to filter for certain types of wells. So that type of reporting functionality is already built on the Sigma Data Viewer, which will be automatically updated with the new information that comes in uh, through the GSP submission. All right, so now we'll move to some of the questions that came in regarding the GSP reporting system. And just as a reminder, if you do have additional questions, please email them to that sgmps at water.ca.gov. Thank you. All right, so now we'll go on to another question. Um, so the first question is in regards to when this tool will be available. 
So that's a good question. I forgot to mention that during my presentation. This is Heather Shannon again. Um, so we intend to have the tool up and live in September. Um, and that will give folks the ability to log in, um, download the Excel spreadsheet and begin working with it um, and working with the tool to, um, uh, so they can address any questions they might have. Okay. Um, the next question is in regards to uh, when the Excel template will be available um, or will it be available in advance of the portal being launched? So uh, that I just really addressed with the last question. Um, so we will, the Excel template will be available um, when we launch the website, which we anticipate in September. And will the GSP submission materials, such as the user guide, be available at that time? Yes, uh, we intend to uh, release the user guides when we launch the website. Uh, the next question um, has to do with uh, um, the initial notifications um, as they relate to submittal of a GSP. Um, each GSP should have its own initial notification and a single initial notification can be submitted uh, on behalf of the group of GSAs that are coming together to prepare that GSP. Next question. Um, would it be possible to have the option to fill out an Excel spreadsheet for the references instead of filling out the individual reference pieces? It could include all of the same fields as required online. So we did uh, receive this similar uh, question at our public meetings that we had earlier this week in Fresno and in Bakersfield. And so we're working on a um, spreadsheet that could be uh, uh, downloaded by the user, filled in with the required fields, and then uploaded into the system. Uh, this would also the user would also then be required to upload any of those documents individually and, and identify um, the specific file names or associated URLs. Um, but that's uh, something that's in, in progress and we appreciate your feedback on that. Um, the tool is not final and live yet, so we are um, any comments that you have, we do appreciate to, so that we can make it uh, more user friendly. Uh, next question, does the public have access to the information while the GSA is entering GSP information to DWR? So while the GSA is entering information um, on the GSP reporting system, it is not publicly available. The information would not be publicly available until the GSA has submitted that information to DWR. The reason being that, you know, they have the opportunity to save and continue and go back. Um, and so the information that they have on the, on the system may not be final until they have selected to submit it to DWR. And on a related note to that, the information that's going to be submitted as part of the GSP is ado uh, the adopted GSP. And that adoption process is a local public process. And so if there's a, a desire to understand what information is being adopted and ultimately will be submitted to the DWR, that's an opportunity to engage in that process and understand that information. Okay, and we have last question. Uh, will there be a way to submit a file like a bib text file, Microsoft Word Citation Manager, XML, uh, RIS, or EndNote, rather than render this information again into the web portal? Generally, these citation managers have a way to export import. So uh, that's a good, great question. Um, similar to the question uh, that I addressed regarding an Excel spreadsheet for the references, 
Um, so as I mentioned, we're, we're looking into making a modification to the system to enable folks to fill in information at once instead of doing uh, the, instead of entering it individually. Um, we'll have to look into uh, what flexibility we can have to potentially use um, our import files from some of these other uh, citation manager programs. Okay, thank you, Monica and Heather. Uh, nothing else. So it looks like those are the questions we've received so far. We can pause for a moment to see if there's any additional questions on the GSP reporting system or monitoring module. And again, please submit those questions to or email them to sgmps at water.ca.gov. So while we're waiting for some of those questions, if they're going to come in, I just wanted to say that after, uh, if you have a question after this presentation, uh, please reach out to Heather Shannon at the at her email address uh, related to the GSP submittal tool, or Ben Gooding regarding the monitoring network. We are also working with our regional offices, our larger Sigma team in the four region offices in Red Bluff in the north, West Sacramento, Fresno, and Glendale. And they also have a familiarity and will be available to answer questions as it pertains to the various basins that they're working within from now until plan submission and beyond. So those, I encourage you to reach out now um, if you do have questions, and uh, so we can make sure to answer those questions as best we can um, so there aren't any unresolved issues running up to the GSP uh, submission deadline in the end of January. So let's do another check. Is there any questions that have come in? Okay. So it looks like we don't have any more questions that have come in and want to thank all of you for submitting those questions. Those are good questions and as Heather mentioned, we are looking for feedback as we move to finalize the development of this very important tool. We want to make sure it's as, as efficient and facilitates that the submittal of your GSP to the Department of Water Resources. So and also would like to thank all of you for tuning in today and on this webinar. And as mentioned before, we are recording this and we'll be posting it on our web page in the near future. That'll be on the Groundwater Sustainability Plan web page. As Heather mentioned, we will be uh, following up and providing additional guidance, more detailed guidance, as well as um, pocket guides and other material to help facilitate um, and get a better understanding of how GSPs will be submitted and how GSAs will use this tool. As I mentioned, please feel free to reach out to us or our region office partners. Um, we will be, as I mentioned, training all of our region office staff and point of contacts so they'll be available to answer questions as they attend the basin meetings um, between now and um, the plan submission deadline. So, and, and last, we just at the department want to thank all of you for the hard work that's being done to develop these groundwater sustainability plans across the state and again are here to provide support on a variety of fronts uh, for that effort and particularly on the topic of today's webinar for that efficient submittal of the groundwater sustainability plans. So with that, we'll sign off and have a great rest of your day. Thank you.